Hello and welcome. You're listening to the Tech for Leaders podcast brought to you by Mazars. This is the podcast where we take technology topics and discuss how business leaders can tackle them. I'm your host, Andrew Rawlings Catterall, a privacy specialist in technology and digital, and we'll be talking throughout this series with industry guests, specialist speakers, and subject matter experts about how businesses are tackling the latest tech developments and challenges whilst minimizing risk and ensuring security and regulatory compliance. At Mazars, we believe technology can help businesses, both large and small, help improve and advance their operations, improve productivity and growth. And so we look forward to sharing our knowledge, our insights, practical tips, and how businesses can leverage technology to gain that all important edge. And now, on with this week's show. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Tech for Leaders podcast with Mazar. For our returning listeners, welcome back. And for those of you who are new to the podcast, welcome also. I'm your host, Alex Miller. I'm an ethical hacker and red teamer, which means that I perform simulated cyber attacks to help customers better understand their cyber risk. In today's episode, we'll be exploring tales from the cyber front line of digital forensics and incident response. And I'm thrilled to be joined by Simon Lang, Head of Incident Response and Digital Forensics at Mazars. Welcome, Simon. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Fabulous. Simon has the best part of 15 years experience in the digital forensics and incident response field. And I'm also thrilled to announce that Simon has also been appointed an assessor for Crest in digital, uh, sorry, in incident response, isn't it? That's great, yeah. And for our listeners that aren't familiar with Crest, Crest are the Council of Registered Ethical Security Testers. It's a very prestigious role to be given. So congratulations again. Oh, thank you. Most definitely is. And I'm really excited to be supporting them as well. So fabulous. Welcome, Simon. Thank you for taking the time out to speak with us today. So let's delve right in. For our listeners who are maybe less familiar with digital forensics and incident response, what are these terms? How do we describe them? Perfect. So um, digital forensics is basically examination of devices and data, um, stuff in the cloud as well, um, try and piece together pieces of evidence um, to either present in court or to present to um, various stakeholders within organisations to show that a crime has been committed or the inverse of that, that a crime actually hasn't been committed um, there. On incident response, This is where we get called in, so an incident happens, a cyber incident happens, ransomware, inside a threat, um, along those lines, Mm -hmm. where we get called in during what we call um, the golden few hours. Um, As soon as the incident's happened, best to get us on on board there so we can uh, get in there, crack on, and try and contain whatever threat it is at that point in time. Exciting. Yeah. And these are both blue team services, right? So whereas I'm as a penetration tester and ethical hacker, I'm a red teamer. So maybe we just explain briefly what we mean by blue team and then I'll, I'll pick up red team. Perfect. Yeah. So um, blue team and red team in um, uh, um, from a high level, uh, military terms. Um, so blue is the good is, um, the good side. Red are the bad is. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> red, are, red are the bad is there. So from the blue team, we're the defenders. Uh, we're trying to defend um, digital estates, um, uh, protect individuals, etc., protect their data um, however we can. Or if the worst has happened and have been compromised, to go in and find out, like a police officer, what has happened? Um, how has this happened? What we can do in the future to protect um, them to make sure it doesn't happen again? Mm, certainly. And I think red team is also really value from understanding that mindset because red team is essentially, as you said, from that military background is playing offensive, playing the baddies. So um, trying to break networks, penetrate them, um, not necessarily, yeah, break is probably the wrong word, but identify vulnerabilities, yeah. exploit vulnerabilities and identify weaknesses in networks. It's kind of what we call red team, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And what about purple? I know it just sounds like we're plucking colours out of the air now, but what do we mean by purple teaming? <laughs> so purple team is um, a fairly new concept um, and something um, that we're working on at the minute. Um, the red and blue team combine. Um, red and blue together make purple. Um, so combining those um, those mentalities, um, those uh, techniques um, there. So as a blue team, if we understand how the red team is, um, how the attackers can gain access, we can better protect. And from the red team point of view, if you understand how we're protecting, um, you can better Mm. Uh, find other avenues, other attack vectors uh, to get in there. Yep, and obfuscations and the likes. Yeah, we yeah. love obfuscation, yeah. Absolutely. 
And then kind of beyond DFIR, digital forensics into response, you've also got lots of experience in PCI, right? And I'm just saying acronyms now, but that's payment card industry. Um, how does digital forensic investigations in the payment card world vary to other industries? Uh, good question. So um, in my previous role, um, I was what's called a PFI. And so a PFI is a payment card industry forensic investigator. Um, so it's literally doing the same as what we're doing in the digital forensics and incident response world, but within the payment card industry, that's highly regulated um, because obviously um, money is very important. People don't want to lose money um, there. So what happens is if a organization who is accepting um, credit card payments is breached, be it in a shop um, with a, a point of sale terminal or a website, an e-commerce website, um, we'll get called in to investigate that uh, following a certain methodology. Um, so. Not only is um, investigating that important, um, but containing it and providing remedial mm. remediation advice as well um, is super important because they can't afford for it to happen again. Yeah. So, for instance, um, websites getting hacked um, there, credit card skimmers getting put on the website um, uh, will be called in to look through the code on the website to try and work out where that credit card skimmer is. We know it's there, we've just got to figure out how it is. Um, and it's hard to say this. But I respect the ingenuity um, yeah. of the hackers. Um, sometimes it's cat and mouse. Um, they'll yeah. come up with new techniques. We have to figure out what they're doing, um, et cetera, um, there. But the ingenuity they come up with at times is um, absolutely amazing. So that's the only respect I can give them, uh, but respect <laughs> nonetheless um, there, because they can do some very clever things. Uh, but then it keeps us busy trying yeah. to um, figure out exactly what they have done and stopping it from happening again. Yeah, and it's guess that purple teaming methodology, that's exactly what we're trying to emulate, that cat and mouse, yeah. learning from each other to kind of beat the adversary. Um, yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And do you see a lot of common attack vectors in your incident response work? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking of the big ones our, our listeners might be familiar with, ransomware, phishing, um, you know, vulnerable software, unpatched software. Are those what you see in incident response? Most definitely, right? So um, common attack vectors um, there. Probably um, the most common we see um, inside a threat. Um, really? I wasn't expecting you to say that. Oh, no, no, and it's growing um, it's growing immensely um, at the minute um, there. So uh, inside a threat is basically an employee, be it a rogue employee or an employee um, who has a grudge to bear, obviously, that's also a rogue employee, but also a user error um, mm. can be a um, form of insider threat. Um, so what we see a lot is rogue employees, disgruntled employees um, there who aren't happy with the organization, or they are happy, but they're being offered money elsewhere um, by certain ransomware groups, um, certain threat actors mm. to um, put malware on systems, uh, to steal data. Um, we also see a lot of um, with people leaving their roles to go work elsewhere, they're taking data with them. Uh, they could be using that to leverage uh, new positions elsewhere or just give them a head start um, when they get there. But that, all that is inside a threat um, there. Um, so protecting against that, but also for us to come in and investigate um, that to give the evidence needed um, to either prosecute um, or to uh, carry out legal actions um, there. But mm -hmm. um, Fishing. Um, so fishing <laughs> is a... Um, not going anywhere. <laughs> no, no, unfortunately not. Um, no matter how many um, fishing exercises people do, fishing training, it's still going to be around, unfortunately. Um, and the techniques is going to improve, improve, improve. Yeah. When it came to um, our respect for their ingenuity, it's constantly evolving. We see a lot of... Um, um, Emails coming through purporting to be from Microsoft or um, from somebody else. Click this link. Um, they're clicking this link thinking they're logging into um, their online Outlook. Um, they're, they're not. They're logging onto the, um, the threat actor's website. Uh, it looks exactly like it. Entering their credentials. That's it. They're compromised at that point um, uh, there. They may have multi-factor authentication enabled yeah. um, there, but it's easy uh, for the threat act. I want to say easy, but it's possible for the threat actors um, to um, exploit that as well. Yeah. Um, one thing we're seeing at the minute with multi-factor is um, alert fatigue. Um, so the threat actors will spam these uh, multi-factor alerts. So try and log in um, there. The user keeps getting notifications saying, is this you, is this you, is this you? Mm -hmm. And they're clicking no, no, no. But they're continuing doing, being persistent. Eventually the, the user uh, has had enough, click yes, because they want it to go away. 
and that's it. They've got their the access needed at that point um, there. So we're seeing, uh, unfortunately, an increase in um, that at the minute as well. Uh, well that's interesting yeah. about the alarm fatigue one. I've definitely heard of that. I've actually never used it on a red team myself, but certainly multi-factor authentication bypasses I've used. Yeah. Not through that specific methodology of, of sending multiple codes, but it's technically much easier to bypass multi-factor authentication than I think you would hope. Not from a technical standpoint, but as you said, from a social engineering standpoint, yes. asking somebody for the code in the same way you would ask them for their password. And if they enter it, then I've still managed to get into the account. Yeah. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. cat and mouse back so, to that. Yeah, unfortunately, um, a lot of the attack vectors involve the user, um, yeah. we find. Um, obviously, you do get the um, outdated and vulnerable software um, that and in an ideal world, everybody will be patching and be up to date with the latest and greatest software. It's just not possible. Um, mm. Therefore, all the one in the world, it just won't happen. So obviously, um, that's got to be bared in mind as well. Um, mm. But user interaction, negative user interaction on that is obviously a, a key topic and something that um, um, we see too much, unfortunately. And just going back to the insider threat one, I'm interested in that. Um, I know that in the dark web, you know, it's not uncommon for kind of bounties to be placed on people's heads for, as you said, in organizations to reveal credentials, gain access, whatever it is. So you're saying that that's actually, people are taking that up now. Do you think that's related to kind of the current economic climate, perhaps? You know, we are in a recession now. Um, is that something you think is going to affect that? Okay, yeah, yeah, good question. Um, so basically, so um, earlier in the year um, there, Personally, I've never seen such an uptick in um, oh. um, incident, cyber incident, the situation in the Ukraine. Um, but leading up to that, um, I'd never seen so um, many um, cyber incidents being reported to us for us to investigate, um, etc. Um, wow. There, and we weren't expecting uh, the outcome after that to be what's happening in Ukraine at the minute. Um, there is there any correlation between the two? Um, personally. Potentially, um, obviously, I'm not an expert and cannot say that definitively that is the case um, there, but we did see that. And then obviously the roll on effect of that, um, the financial situation everyone's in at the minute, mm. um, people people want money. Um, there is a recession hitting it, et cetera. Um, there. And what we see during these financial hardships are people more willing um, to do um, nefarious acts um, in order to get money? Um, and for the simple fact of them, installing an application on the system or um, giving their credentials to a threat uh, a threat group online, um, you could say it's easy money for them. Um, mm. Obviously, it's unethical. Um, uh, illegal. There. Illegal. <laughs> Even better. Even better. Um, illegal there. But um, yeah, we do see that, um, especially when financial times are quite um, uh, hard in the world. Uh, so, yeah. Interesting backdrop mm. to that. Yeah. yeah. And I know most of our audience are probably aware of the kind of rise of true crime podcasts and uh, documentary series. But I understand that you were involved in one of these from a kind of digital forensic standpoint. You have to tell us more about this. Okay, okay. Um, so yeah, I'll tell you a story about, um, so I've been on a couple of documentaries. This interview yourself is far easier than, than that. So thank you, <laughs> thank you for that um, and taking the fresh off there. But with these documentaries, it was a, um, a case um, so it's quite a few years ago um, in the South Wales area there. Um, unfortunately, a man murdered his wife in a hotel room um, in a city there. Um, he killed her, went on the run, um, went to an airport to try and uh, escape the country. So during that time, once the, the uh, police had found the body, what they found was a mobile phone device um, there. It was locked um, there. They couldn't get access to it um, there, um, but they knew that I would be able to. So I was tooling around in the office on one Saturday um, <laughs> there, uh, randomly a phone call um, saying, we've got this mobile phone here. Uh, we need access to it um, literally as soon as possible um, because the guy's on the run. Uh, we need to catch him um, uh, ASAP uh, there. So. Um, all the way from South Wales, driving driving up north, um, there blues and twos on the police car to bring me wow. this mobile phone. It turns out what happened is, the man that killed his wife, they both had identical phones. He left his phone at the scene, but picked hers up by mistake um, there. So that's why um, getting access to that phone um, ASAP uh, was absolutely imperative to see what had been bought, what hadn't, et cetera, there. So phone was brought to the lab um, there. 
and book it all in um, there. And then I had to perform, and it was, a, it was an older Samsung, uh, older Samsung, let's say an S6, um, Samsung S6 from a few years ago um, there. So what I had to do, because of the, encrypt, not the encryption, but because of the security on the phone, mm. um, it wasn't possible using conventional digital forensic techniques to get the data off the phone. So what I had to do, I had to dismantle the phone uh, completely right down to the circuit board um, there, desolder the memory chip off the phone wow. um, where the data is held, um, read that using specialist equipment um, there, and then piece all the data back together into human rebuild format. Um, so all the internet history, uh, text messages, WhatsApp, um, literally everything on the phone like in read somebody's life on, on yeah. the phone um, by doing that. Gosh, um, scary. There. It really is um, there. And the problem with this technique um, there, can't guarantee 100% success uh, because it's a destructive process. Um, you only get one chance of Goodness. doing it and removing this chip and reading it. I did read it on this occasion. There have been occasions historically where um, the chip hasn't been readable after that and there's nothing worse. There's no worse feeling in the world than that. Mm. Um, that isn't your fault, um, but you do feel you do feel guilty about it um, nonetheless. So yeah, got all the data, um, pieced it all back together, um, sent it straight back to the police um, there, uh, triaged some of the information to work out what was happening to try and give them a head start. Unfortunately, he had already got to the airport, already jumped into a flight, I believe, to um, uh, Dubai at that point. Um, there. But they did manage to get him uh, in another country and arrest him. Um, he got sentenced uh, successfully. Um, because of your, yeah. partly because of your hard work. Yeah, Amazing yeah. story. So yeah, um, working in the digital forensics um, uh, field, um, worked on a lot of high profile um, criminal cases across the UK and internationally as well. And there's no better feeling than actually providing evidence to the police that will support a uh, conviction of somebody who is actually guilty um, of that. So one of the biggest cases I've probably worked um, up in Manchester, um, Dale Cregan, for people who don't know, who's um, part of an organised crime group um, there. Um, he's the um, person who um, murdered the two police women um, and was um, had access to grenades, etc., up in Manchester. So. Um, he killed some people, um, unfortunately, there. Uh, went on the run um, mm -hmm. there, and his co-conspirators were hiding him in various places um, there. One of his um, um, co-conspirators um, there who was phoning him around um, was using a car, um, had a sat-nav in the car. Um, as soon as you put the key in, turn the ignition on, the sat-nav turns on. Mm -hmm. um, it starts recording. Um, there, So they're driving around. Um, the police get the vehicle. Um, so I'm called in to have a look at this um, sat nav. It was potentially a TomTom -tom device um, at that point in time um, prior to inbuilt um, sat navs being the norm uh, there. So I managed to piece the evidence back together from this um, sat nav device to show exactly where and when they were going, what times, where they were going, and potentially wow. where people were hiding, um, yeah. et cetera. There. Showed them going to McDonald's, um, <laughs> all sorts of things like that. Um, but I worked um, and gave quite a lot of evidence on that um, investigation um, for the murders and the co conspirator um, aspect of it as well. But um, yeah, it's um, been an interesting life in the world of digital forensics. So, yeah. Certainly, goodness, that yeah. criminal aspect as well really brings it home as to the importance of what we're doing, what you're doing in particular. Is massive. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and that, so that's really interesting kind of digital forensic war stories. What about if we put the incident response hat on, you know, something really bad's happened on a side on a computer network, more my kind of home, <laughs> yeah, yeah. more familiar with. What war stories have you got for incident response? Okay, from that, um, from that aspect um, uh, there, um, been called into various organisations, so um, be it um, uh, school networks um, where um, clever students um, <laughs> un <laughs> illegally um, there have put crypto mining software on the servers. Um, yes. So mining for um, Bitcoin. And yeah, Monero in this instance. Um, okay. um, there, uh, trying to hide the traces, etc. So obviously using a lot of resources um, there, but because some of the um, infrastructure is based in the cloud in AWS, spinning up new instances of computing power there so it's costing oh it's costing these um, um these schools a lot of money in compute power um when it shouldn't be so uh trying to work out that put um hands at keyboards at the time as to who did what um with various login credentials um etc um there um quite a few intellectual property from a very high level um and worth a lot of money uh, mm -hmm. cases where employees have taken data, they've gone and set up their own businesses, et cetera, and uh, leverage that data to um, promote themselves um, and to give them that edge in business. Um, obviously, they know what the other organizations are doing. 
hedge funds who have these clever algorithms that work out um, what to do in the markets, um, people taking those to their um, new em new employees, etc. Stakes are high in these, right? Oh, it's, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, the stakes were high in the digital forensics side, but in a different way, they're high on the incident response side. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's like, unfortunately, life and death in digital forensics mm. on occasion um, there. But incident response, um, a lot of it's about money reputation, um, things like that uh, um, with that. So... Yeah, um, lots of cases um, there. Um, ransomware. Um, mm -hmm. So, so ransomware has evolved quite a lot. People think of ransomware; they think of encrypting data on computers. Um, yeah. With that, um, there what a lot of the threat groups now are doing um, is extortionware. So, not only will they encrypt the data, um, they will exfiltrate that data, take that data off the network, so host it somewhere. So they're saying to the organisation who's been breached, um, "You pay some money." We'll give you the key to unlock it. Uh, we'll also delete the data we're holding on you. If you don't pay it within this time frame, say three days, for instance, um, we will release it to the public. Um, mm -hmm. And you don't want your data being released to the public. Um, yeah. Reputational damage um, with that is um, um, immense um, yeah. um, uh, there. Um, but yeah, with, with the incidents, um, a common one, uh, again, comes down to um, often the user error Inside a threat, but from the user error point of view, business email compromise. Um, we see a lot of that with the fraud. Um, so what I mentioned before about the phishing and um, people clicking the links and inadvertently giving access to their Office 365 environments, uh, their email environments, what will happen then, the threat actor will gain access to that um, there. They will intercept emails. Um, so an email will come in, they'll be monitoring it. They'll move it to a folder that no one will ever check, a notes folder or something um, nested down in various folders. Um, work on it, change invoices, edit invoices, um, so change the bank account details. So when people are paying these invoices, um, it's going to the incorrect bank accounts um, and they're taking um, money off uh, uh, that way. They'll create rules. So if people within this chain of communicating with each other, they'll create rules to um, mark as read and move to a folder. Um, mm. So it's all automatic at that point. So the user isn't aware of an email coming in um, because these rules have been created. If an email comes in um, um, matching this criteria, so at Mazars, um, et cetera, there, it will move it to this folder um, there so they can um, um, hide it. Uh, but yeah, it's um, we see a lot of it um, there. Um, so we get called in after the fact for those sites of investigation to show what's happened, yeah. where it's gone, how it's happened. Um, more importantly, make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, mm. yeah. yeah, those business email compromises. And I think I see it in the red team perspective on people yeah. imitating suppliers and supply chain attacks. As you said, if you can kind of change invoices internally, but also if you can just mimic a supplier, pretend to be one, and yeah. then uh, add some urgency to that. I really need to be paid this. It's the end of the month. Please do it now. Urgency no, is key. Yeah. And having the, um, um, so with the, um, with the phishing, so when they're doing the targeted phishing um, um, there, they'll want access to finance department or other people. Um, but a lot of time we see, uh, see the CEO, the MD uh, getting um, mimicked there. And with the urgency of that, uh, people yeah. panic when they see an email from um, somebody important in an organization and think um, um, they might have to cut a corner to get this done quickly for them. So yeah, mm, yeah absolutely. So Let's pretend I'm in an organization that hasn't started a journey with IR or DF, digital forensics or incident response. How should I approach that? When when, when do I know it's kind of right for my organization? Is there a right time to get started? There's no there's no perfect time like the present. Um, every organization should have some sort of um, IR plan, IR contingency, incident response contingency to do with um, cyber um, there. Because it's so common. It doesn't matter the business size. Um, you could mm. become a target um, um what we offer um, there, so instant response retainers um, there, we can tailor these um, to various organization sizes um, there, whereby um, it, you can pay up front and have reduced fees and um, various SLAs, so an SLA in regards to how fast we can respond um, to that. But mm -hmm. we can also have for smaller organizations and organizations who um, uh, don't have that much financial support, um, mm. a no charge, um, a no fee retainer, where all the legal contract work is signed ahead of time. Um, there was no need for fees at that point um, there. Because a lot of time with these instant response cases, time is of the essence. We need to literally start looking and trying to contain this straight away. Um, and there's nothing worse um, there that we're trying to support an organization 
that it gets held up on the paperwork side of life. So having yeah. that done ahead of time is uh, fantastic. And then yeah. having that number to ring or the email address to ring that's tailored for them um, in their time in need um, there um, and have that embedded within their um, uh, disaster recovery or incident response plan um, uh, there for that immediate support um, mm. uh, there. But like I said, there is literally no time like the present um, um, for that. Yeah, because yeah, I think from that red team perspective, um, I often, you know, test, blue teams and mm -hmm. and the detection capabilities of blue teams through yes yeah, simulating adversary threats um but actually that doesn't still in some ways prepare you for that moment when it really does happen and everything's yeah. kind of going wrong there's that sense of urgency there's a panic i guess we kind of in crisis simulation at that point um in preparing for that what is crisis simulation and and um disaster recovery planning we mentioned drp yeah. What what is that, and okay. why should people take lesson to that? No, I have military background um, there, um, and a lot of things. I think we have actually. We should probably, I should probably have introduced this. So you were in the uh, military police before your digital forensic incident response career, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, sorry, I should have introduced that. That's before. okay. <laughs> we just glossed over it with the uh, red team blue team uh, analogy there, but it's okay. Um, um, yeah. So um, um, served in the military police uh, for uh, six years in the regulars, um, and probably same again six seven years in the um, reserves once I um, once I left. The, the regular service there. Um, there. Did that prepare you for your transition to industry? What, what was that like? Oh yeah, well, um, most definitely. So um, we're in the regulars. Uh, well, I'd say that, that it gave me that mindset. It didn't give me the technical aptitude um, um, there or the technical knowledge to do what I do now. Mm. Um, that came through hands-on experience within within industry um, there, but it gave me that mindset um, of what to look for, especially the police policing aspect of it, that investigatory mindset um, there. One of the reasons I'm um, good at what I do is persistence um, there. Uh, I won't let something go on an investigation. Um, mm. I'll keep looking until I can find it um, yeah. um, there. So I think it gave that mindset. Um, um, Solving the there. puzzle. Exactly. I like that. Um, yeah. Um, I very much like that uh, um, there. So yeah, um, I did quite a couple, of, uh, quite a few operational tours um, there. Um, started up in Northern Ireland, did uh, two tours of Iraq um, whilst I served. And at that point, um, then I wanted to do something different in my life. Um, and I went to university. So I went as a mature student. Um, I wouldn't have been able to go to university when I was younger because I didn't have that mindset or the, um, um, yeah, that educational aptitude to sit there during lectures and listen and they're very <laughs> excitable when I was younger um, there so it helped me help me with that as well uh, there so I went to university a bit later in life um, at that point and that's when I served in the reserves um, there so it helped fund me through university because wow. um, yeah it's obviously not cheap going to uni these days mm, mm. Mm. yeah I guess that was a nice little detour yeah <laughs> and so uh, that military <laughs> mindset as well on the kind of disaster recovery and the keeping cool head in case of emergency that that must help you day, day to day still yeah most definitely so um a good thing um I won't read out the um the analogy there um but the full one uh, uh oh, I think pri I know pri preparation etc um <laughs> there so prepping for that um is key practicing it is key um mm. there so uh, standard operating procedures we call them uh, they're practicing those over and over again until it's, it's second nature mm. so should something happen you know what to do muscle memory um yeah. there you know exactly what to do so having that ahead of time um there so when you're doing um what we call tabletop exercises or tabletop simulations um, there, they are good to do, something that we help organizations uh, do uh, because there's nothing better than actually them going through their processes of running through a, a live um, mimic of an attack, a simulated attack um, there. So uh, we tailor, rather than it being a case of a generic um, or you got a ransomware from five years ago on your system or uh, what you do here, um, it will be... Um, tailored to that organization what are current threats for that type of organization mm. uh, what infrastructure do they currently have how can we tailor it there to make it more realistic um, and exciting we're currently building um something virtual reality uh, metaverse type um stuff there uh, for the higher level for the c-suites um etc because we want to get them involved uh, yeah. from a technical perspective it's very rare for them to be involved um they'll be overseeing um in the background but to have them um visualizing the virtual reality see what's happening see what computers are being used um, where what people are doing in various places um, having it that way gives them a better picture than a boring 
tabletop exercise, so to speak, um, <laughs> um, then we, we find that, that that helps a lot. Um, the immersive that, nature yeah, of it. And, yeah, and it excites people that way. Um, yeah, memorable rather, as well. Yes. Rather than being a mandatory yearly um, mm. thing they have to do, it's something they look forward to. Um, I do, yeah. 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 yeah, I can concur with that. I think a lot of cybersecurity training is quite dull. Yep. Uh, as much as I love cybersecurity as well. <laughs> yeah, cyber's the best, but yeah, I know yeah, what you mean. Yeah. But cyber training, mm, could do with some help sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, virtual headsets are great, but what free resources can we point people towards in this space? You know, what can people look up now? I mean, one thing that I've used before, and I know that you're also a fan of, is exercise in a box. Yep. Which is the NCSE tooling. I don't I don't know if you want to go into that in more detail. Most definitely. Yeah, yeah. Happy to give them a shout out um, there. Okay. Uh, so NCSC, National Cyber Security Centre, they're an offshoot of um, um, GHQ, GCHQ, sorry, um, here within the UK. Um, so with that, um, there, the exercise in a box. So it's an online toolbox, mm. um, but it allows simulated like we talked before like a uh, simulated um type of attack so people could understand how they what they would do in various scenarios it covers so much um yeah. it's got um it's got the ransomware um it's got supply chain attacks um which i'll cover it covering a bit um there it's got inside a threat um there's so many on the list there's so many different exercises that you can perform um to have your IT team um, running through it so they can understand what's happening um, and what they should be doing, um, how they should be doing it. Um, and the best part is free. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It I, I've, it's been a few years since I've used it. I used it when it first came out. Um, and for a free resource, as you said, there's so many options with it. And it really does get you thinking. That's right. Yeah. So I had my first exposure to it. Um, it was a, a few years ago now. Um, again, um, the, what happened was a... Um, a laboratory um, in the in the UK was hit by ransomware, um, and this laboratory supported the criminal justice system on various aspects um, there. So, because there had been an intrusion to the network, there was a worry that um, that threat group could be targeting other laboratories, uh, be it traditional forensic laboratories or be it digital forensic laboratories. Um, there, so if they could disrupt the criminal justice system in the UK by altering evidence, or mm. even given the um, the risk that evidence could have been altered, it would have a significant impact on there. So um, uh, NCSE called in various organizations to come in um, um, and try and look at that um, for that preparedness within their laboratories. So yeah, yeah, no, really helpful. Interesting yeah. case. Yeah, I think it's in, going back to the threat actors piece again, it's about um, their motives, right? And threat actors are so, we, it's easy to group them and we do do through APT groups and the likes, but yeah. actually about getting down to the motives and you're saying disrupting the criminal justice system is quite a kind of large, yeah. grandiose Yeah, well, yeah, it's not all <laughs> about money. It's not all about money. Um, the, lots of the threat groups are money orientated. They do want to go, against, uh, go, go for money. Even some of the nation state ones um, will be going for money um, because sanctions imposed on them. Um, it's an easy way for them to get money. Um, we saw Sony hacks um, a few years ago and things like that from various countries uh, attacking them um, mm. and attacking other organizations um, there. So money is involved, but there's the other aspect to it um, um, as well. Even when these threat groups may not have been successful, but they give that illusion of success um, there. The to, kudos. Yeah, yeah. And, and get people worried. Um, mm. Potentially has this happened. And then it starts a lot of um, um, worry. Um, there but yeah 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 um, mm. um i've seen on the ransomware side as well some threat actors not necessarily holding the data ransom just deleting it i mean there is kind of wiper malware as well which just deletes it but actually threat actors you know deleting ec2 instances which are like elastic it's a kind of ser server in um, aws or deleting backups of things just purely because they can and to cause yeah. chaos right well yeah yes yeah. kind of yeah uh, well and villain -esque yeah. thing to yeah, exactly do. um yeah and some of the, um, I'd say, immature actors would definitely be doing things like that um, there. So not nation states or anything along those lines, um, but they would just cause disruption. Mm. Um, could even argue it's a form of terrorism. Um, obviously not physical terrorism as we know it um, there, um, but anything to create terror and panic um, there works um, with that. Um, especially um, a good example of that is NHS from a few years ago, um, where they the WannaCry attack. Um, so a ransomware that hit the NHS, um, they uh, compromised so many systems and held it to ransom. Um, there was financial motivation behind it, apparently, but could was that uh, definitive? Was that mm. just a cover? Um, was it just to cause disruption and panic, um, especially because it's the NHS um, and what yeah. we rely on? Um, that that was an interesting one because. Um, 
the NHS, they got uh, they got hit with this ransomware, WannaCry. Um, but there was a security researcher who, uh, looking through the code, he found a domain within the code. Uh, that domain wasn't registered. Um, as soon as he registered that domain, it slowed down the um, propagation um, of that um, ransomware because that was the thing the ransomware was looking for. It knew if that um, domain had been registered, it was to stop doing what it was doing because... Um, it was beaconing out to be it. Yes, that exactly was the, that. Yeah, yeah. And that was the thing. This is my language now. Yeah. Back to my red tape. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. Absolutely amazing um, there. And so obviously now, they, the threat actors know not to put it in clear text. Um, they can encrypt it, um, obfuscate it um, there. Um, so a lot of the time when we're doing the um, PFI work and before, um, because... A lot of people install on their e-commerce websites, security scanning software, especially on the um, Magento ones and things like that on WordPress um, there. The threat actors had to obfuscate the code and for people don't know who that what that word means, even though I had trouble pronouncing it at it's times a um, one. <laughs> um, there. It just means um, encoding it in a way. Uh, it's a fancy way of saying encoding it at the end of the day. Um, there's, they could use Base64, um, which isn't human readable, but it's easy to convert, or they could encrypt it, encode it uh, via other methods and things like that. Um, so the security and scanning tools aren't picking it up um, um, as easily. They will pick it up, but just not as easily as if it was um, a URL or... The or equivalent whatever. of a balaclava for code. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I wonder what, what does good look like in the DFIR space? We've talked about table talk exercises, maybe exercise and as being a great free resource. Retainers and preparedness, do you have a number to call? If, have I painted a good picture or? No, you most definitely have. Um, if I could emphasize um, something enough, it, it would be retainers um, there because you do need that um, You do need that support um, there. Um, even if you have an IT team in-house, they're not subject matter experts in this type of thing. It's good to have that, um, that number to call. Um, the, the, like I say, the subject matter experts who understand this, who live and breathe this um, there. The because geeks. Yeah, because you haven't got time to be um, um, Googling what to do, when and where, and how to do best practice and things like that during an incident. Uh, you need geeks like us to come in and um, um, know what they're doing, who um, have been doing this for a number of years, um, and get it to sort as quick as possible. Because the longer it goes on for, um, the potential for lateral movement within the network of a system's getting compromised, um, further data getting exfiltrated, just further damage at the end of the day. So as soon as you can, as soon as you can get that um, um, contained, um, uh, the better the better there. But um, what else? Um, the, even um, simple things like, um, even though I mentioned multi-factor before, um, there, and it is possible um, through highly competent um, um, threat groups to bypass that or um, skew around it, so to speak, um, there, um, it's imperative you get that. If it's mm -hmm. possible, you need to get a multi-factor on because it's just that extra extra barrier for them to get in the way because they'll go for the, after the low-hanging fruit and the yeah. easy wins um and if they can see you've got various things in place if you've got um, um endpoint detection and response tools um running which um hopefully people people have they will go on to easy targets um um uh, agreed yeah. agreed and it's like even though it's not a silver bullet it's still a protection and it's still as you say just lifting that barrier a little bit making that a little bit harder exactly that um so even though we've um um, been talking a lot about that inside threats ransomware. Um, one thing I think is important to cover um, there that I mentioned briefly before: supply chain attacks. Mm. So, um, as well as the insider threat, um, which is quite common, um, and business email compromise. The, one of the busiest I've ever been was during supply chain, um, a high a high supply chain attack. So, a supply chain attack is when um, a Supplier is targeted because if they can get malware on that supplier systems, um, so software for instance, and that software is rolled out on many organizations' machines, it's so much easier for them. Rather than having to target 100 organizations, they can target this one supplier. Um, there, put the ransomware, put the malware, put whatever on there, uh, command and control tools on there, remote access tools, um, credential stealing tools um, on there and send it out to all these organizations, um, cast that net wide, and they've caught so many um, um, people off guard with that um, there. Mm. So doing your third-party risk assessments on these on your supply chain itself is something you must be doing um, um, as per your uh, standard operating procedures, but regularly. Yeah, um, I couldn't uh, agree with that more. Because yeah. you get so much bang for your buck there, and also it doesn't have to be a technical person doing that job. You know, it's kind of a due diligence corporate 
yeah. role and you can um, do that without kind of needing expertise from other people. And it's that trust piece, right? Because Correct. suppliers are inherently trusted parts of your business. Yes. And you re regularly communicate and liaise with them. It's not unusual when you receive an email from them. We talked about invoices. Yeah. Is it that unusual for an invoice banking details to be changed? Well, maybe that unusual that you would challenge it, right? Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, so yeah, you're right there. Um, but it's something that, um, yeah, people need to keep that in mind um, because it's such an easy, easy target. Um, attack one person and infect loads rather than... We've got what you call water and hole attacks. Um, mm. so this is something I find really this interesting um, there. And if I was a threat actor, which I know they're doing, um, this would be something um, I've been very much doing regularly um, there. So water and hole attack is, uh, the name comes from, um, I don't know, um, you have you have a watering hole where animals drink out of, um, like in the savanna, exactly or something like that. Poison that you're going to poison all these animals um, there. So in this instance, the actual watering hole is a website um, um, there. So if it's for this instance, imagine it's, um, you want to target financial institutions. No, in fact, we'll go pharmaceutical institutions. So during COVID, um, there. Um, COVID vaccines and anything to do with the um, coronavirus um, there. Um, it's big money. People wanted that information. Um, people, the first to market with these um, vaccines, um, we're obviously going to make a lot of money um, mm -hmm. with that. Um, other countries who may not have as um, sophisticated research laboratories um, doing that may want that as well, so they could create their own um, there. So the water and hole attack, um, in that instance, would be um, pharmaceutical publications. Um, so websites, magazines, um, also with pharmaceutical world. Um, so you're targeting that because people in the pharmaceutical industry would be looking at that website um, there. So they'd be going on there, then they would be getting infected. If it's on their work systems, obviously the work systems are getting infected um, there. And that's how the water in Holotap works. Um, so that's something you've got to be mindful of as well nowadays. Um, mm. It's not easy for people to keep um, protected, but um, yeah. Yeah, innovative and uh, yeah. creative attackers, as yeah. you mentioned right at the beginning of this. Novel attacks, that's what I like. And that's why I find this um, industry just so interesting and why, why I like it. Amazing. So we, we've covered so much here, Simon. Thank you so much. And I hope our listeners will replay and use lots of the things I'm sure they will. You've covered the interesting points today. But from your point of view, would there be one key takeaway you can point our listeners to from a digital forensics incident response space? One key thing. Oh, that's a good one. So I won't give one because uh, I won't be able to give just one uh, there. So I've covered quite a lot, haven't I, in regards to what they can do to protect themselves. But I just want people to be protected um, mm. there. So any advice I can give to help them be protected. So they don't actually need, um, they don't need us. Um, that would make me um, happy um, there, but people will need us, um, unfortunately, um, there. But things like um, just making sure their IT estate is um, managed correctly, um, doing, um, doing audits of um, people's um, access rights, um, making mm -hmm. sure um, accounts that shouldn't be active are deactivated. Um, like I said before, multi-factor, that's something um, I'm key to, for people to um, uh, use. Um, robust login. Um, and more importantly, um, with the login and the alerts from the um, endpoint detection tools, it's actually monitoring them. So yeah. no, there's no point having all these logs and all these um, um, detection um, rules set up um, if people aren't actually looking at it. So I know you've had success um, historically in the red team world of um, gaining access to um, organizations. They've had alerts to say, oh, what's this? This shouldn't be happening, but they've ignored it. So um, yeah. Very glossy, fancy, shiny tools in place on that yeah. specific network, but we're not being monitored or attended to. So exactly. all the Christmas tree lights were going off, but nobody was looking at them. Exactly. That. <laughs> so that's, um, it's unfortunate. So yeah, monitoring things like that. Uh, when employees, so inside of threat, um, there, when employees leave, um, make sure um, their accounts are deactivated, their physical access and digital access um, there. Because I know we talk a lot about the cyber incident response, um, but if people can get physical access to a um, um, organization with servers and things like that. There's a lot of damage they can do um, with that or a lot of theft um, they can do along those lines uh, as well. Um, but yeah. Um... No, that's amazing. <laughs> it's great to have that incident response, digital forensic perspective on what's actually happening in the real world, what you're actually seeing. and therefore what we should protect against. So thank you so much, Simon. No, thank you. No, it's been a pleasure. And that concludes this instalment of the Tech for Leaders podcast. We hope you can join us again soon, but for now, farewell. And that brings this week's episode of the Tech for Business Leaders podcast with Mazars to a close. If you enjoyed today's show, please do subscribe to the series and leave a review to help us extend our reach and keep technology at the heart of the business community. 
We look forward to sharing more with you on our next episode. But for now, please do take care and thank you for listening.